Hello, everyone. This is Lynn Davenport and Mary Lowe with Ticked. Tick Ed. <laughs> However, you want to pronounce it. What do you say, Mary? I say we just like ticket and we're ready to get picked up like ticket, oh. you know, the Monday morning quarterback. And we're tackling all of the problems in education. And today we're with Dr. Pat Huff. We're glad to have Dr. Pat Huff with us to talk about the Houston ISD takeover. Um, pros and cons, why we don't like it. And um, what do you say, Dr. Huff? This is your this is your neck of the woods. How do you feel about that? No pros, only cons. Yeah, there's. I don't see any pros. Um, what what um, our commissioner is doing is he he is circumventing our electoral process. He's he's doing a very unrepublic thing. Yeah, and, and the, the the school board is represented is representative of the public the public votes in their school board members and it needs to remain that way now the fact that he is he's using a law 1842 that had the stipulation in there that if you just had one school that you had difficulty in getting them beyond uh in their accountability in other words um, the, the school in question uh, here is Wheatley High School and mm -hmm. has been for, for the longest I can remember. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. they, they have had difficulty getting um, beyond an F until this past year when they decided to do away with all of the D and F schools and that raised the bar of everybody and they ended up making a C. And well, th that's great, but it only means that the next year they're gonna do away with that and we'll be right back where we were again, maybe. That'll be up to to the, the principal and the faculty at Wheatley and and how, the, how hard they work. But again, they're chasing their tail. They're always chasing their tail, everybody is trying to make sure that those outcomes on the test are high enough to stay out of trouble with TEA. And, so, and which test is this, uh, Dr. Huff? The STAR this test. The star. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, uh, and, and let me uh, introduce uh, your background for those who don't know Dr. Pat Huff. So he's a retired middle school and high school pr uh, principal. He wrote a book and it's a long title, Pat, so help me with this. I just say the takeover, but what's the full title? <laughs> it's the takeover of public education in America. And then the subtitle is just as important, maybe more important. Mm -hmm. It is the agenda to control information and knowledge through the accountability system. All right. And, and that, that I, I had you on the Social Impact Podcast, which I can include a link in the the comments here um, yeah. once we publish this, but uh, we, you and I talked about uh, the how we got here with the accountability system, which came out of No Child Left Behind, which reduced the uh, schools to a test, test and punish culture. And it's also a reflection of family income, generally with test scores, where you see higher income, you see higher test scores. And Wheatley is an example of an area, a low income area, high poverty, um area which uh the so the story goes that representative harold dutton was tired of and that's where he didn't he come from that area yeah the Hoyley, up, his school yeah yeah so he grew up there and he's tired of year over year year after year hearing that his school is on the failing list and so he uh what he thought that what would happen is that people would rise up and they and that uh, and that the um school board would actually do something about it and when it was failing again the next time he was he was uh surprised because of this uh new bill or it's not new but uh, new um measure that would come so that bill came out of the 80 what was that the 85th house bill 1842 does that sound right i don't know it's sure. 85th, 86 legislature somewhere around there and some some call that bill the death penalty, and then the clemency is Senate Bill 1882, where they could partner with the charter, and then they get out of jail and be able to, um, you know, 
remains somewhat free under a new uh, govern governance model through the charters, which is a privatization, is a backdoor privatization model. So, okay, so looking at Houston, so now it's all in the news that the talk is that they're going to take over Houston. It's imminent. TEA hasn't really given clarity on when exactly that would happen, but what it looks like when a uh, uh, the state takes over a district is they uh, they appoint a um, what a, a, board. a conservative or a board and a conservator is that right? Uh -huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. There's got to be somebody that oversees that acts like a superintendent, uh, and the board is selected by Morath by the commissioner. Right. Yes. And so, okay, so I'm going to play devil's advocate here. So people are like, well, if the board is corrupt and the board didn't follow TOMA, the Open Meetings Act, and if the board wasn't doing their job and focusing on the kids, then the people can justify, well, then they should be taken over. And this was happening in Dallas ISD back when the commissioner was on the Dallas ISD school board. He tried to take over Dallas ISD through Dallas Home Rule Charter. He found a little loophole in the charter that said he could do that through a mayoral takeover. They just just had to put it to a vote to and um that was shot down but um it it, it ended up being uh, i kind of wish that it had succeeded in dallas because then would we would be able to show that as a model of failure instead he failed upward became commissioner and now this thing is something that could be rolling across the state district upon district that he will take over one at a time the problem that you mentioned about the lack of um you know it's it flies in the face of the republic the democratic process is basically cast is set aside and now we just have a corporate board of managers and we know who Marath will likely choose it's a charter guy and I heard from a legislator democratic legislator told me and told Mary and me that they that they're hearing that it might be Mike Miles who was yeah. a CIST <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. superintendent when Marath was there. So anyway, um, but so back to your book. So you wrote the book and and talked about the accountability system and this punishment that come that came in the form of the accountability system. So tell me okay. more about that. Okay. So this is pertinent to HISD because when when I was going working on my on my doctorate, at the time, there was a phenomenon that was taking place across the country, and that was called school failure. Now, schools have not always failed. Mm -hmm. Kids have failed. Students have failed. And the responsibility to, to, to make a passing grade has fallen on the student. That flipped, and it became the responsibility of the school to make sure that they passed. That's when the accountability system came in. Mm. And it was along the lines of the early 90s. Uh, TOS came in uh, 92, 93. Okay, that's the one you may have taken, Lynn. I graduated in 89, so I don't even remember. I barely graduated, so. <laughs> okay, then you did I not. I do have a college degree, but even that was touch and go. <laughs> <laughs> you, did, you did not apply yourself, Lynn. <laughs> no. The... Um, I was reserving my brain for all of this stuff that you're. There you feeding. go. Okay. Well, you uh, you took a very simple test called um, Teams. You took Teams. I'll just tell you. And so we started off with tabs, and we had Teams here in Texas. For those of you who may be watching in another state, you had a similar type of of uh, sequence of tests that were that were given. Uh, TOS was a fairly easy test. It was the first test that was used uh, that you had to pass to graduate. And and then we moved on to tax when No Child Left Behind came in. And it was quite a quite a, a different difficulty in difficulty. All right. So how does that all all relate? Uh, when I was doing my research for the for my dissertation, this phenomenon was taking place of schools failing. And the reason why they were failing was not because the teachers were doing poorly in their in their instruction and not because the principals had poor leadership, but it was because of no child left behind. And this was a, a form of, of it was a law that was passed that had a failure mechanism built into it. Now, 
as you know, if we have talked, I'm one of the few people that talk about adequate yearly progress. Mm -hmm. There are others, but they, they don't make the connection with, <clears throat> with the waiver. And mm -hmm. so the, the, the waiver was the solution to the fact that all the schools across the country were failing. And by that time we had had a new, a new, um, uh, president in Barack Obama. And so it also shows how the schools, I mean, how the different parties work together in the education system. Uh, it just, uh, just keeps on rolling, no matter who's in the White House. Mm -hmm. Now, what the adequate yearly progress did is those districts that were, I'm getting off topic, but those districts that were, that were very difficult in tough, tough areas like the two that I did in my research in the mm -hmm. east side of Austin, where East Side Memorial was being restructured at the time because of failing AYP year after year. High Hispanic, high poverty. High mobility. Area. High mobility, right. And then the other area was North Forest here in Houston. And North Forest is was the last remaining all black leadership district in Texas. And they were having difficulty achieving adequate yearly progress every year. And the percentages kept going up in terms of what we'd have to have another show to talk about that. But in this particular case, it applies to HISD because what Commissioner Williams did is he allowed HISD to absorb Commissioner Williams was before Morath to absorb North Forest. And they fired all the teachers, hired new teachers, took over leadership in the schools in North Forest. Okay. Well, guess what? Hmm. They're still having difficulty. Yeah. They reconstitute them and it goes back to the same thing. And so it doesn't solve anything. And my frustration with No Child Left Behind, I'll tell you just from my analysis, is that it set up the response to intervention and the um the uh RIT. Yeah, RTI, yeah. And um, but yeah. it also brought in the so contracts. So it set up a marketplace for these contracts like I stations. So you have all these districts that adopted I station and did pilots, and Houston was one of them. And at the time they were a a, a successful district. Um, yeah, as a whole, and that would have been right. They still are. Still, what? They still are. They're well, a B. Their district well, is ready to be. They're rated higher than Dallas ISD, and they're not taking Dallas ISD over, which is is a, a whole other subject. So I've got some of my. They're eye. rated higher than Fort Worth ISD. Now I think they probably are trying to take over Fort Worth ISD. Yeah. I they think we're going to see Dallas. a rash of takeovers. I think we are uh, too. Yeah, and I, I think this is just the beginning. And um, I think that, um, and then I, I'm going to say this and I'm going to hop off. One of the things that I'm really uh, trying to get everybody to wake up to is that th this is the beginning of the nationalization of the schools. They're going to start here in Texas because it's the largest. And California will be super easy to convert because of who's there. Uh, Texas will be the challenge. And the other thing that you see is that all of the school districts are being taught by TASB to have their own police department. And when the schools are taken over and they have their own police department, you now have a national police force, which is the final straw to end um, a republic. I mean, it Ooh. is. So they're, they're using the schools for this and it's all bogus. Um, I'm going to, I, thanks for coming on. I'm going to let you guys wrap up and I'm going to go see if I can't keep my dogs from barking at you. Thanks okay. a bunch for coming on. Bye, Mary. Bye. Yeah, I have something in my eye. Um, so, but with the, when she says nationalization, does she mean federalization of education? I think so. And, and so in looking at. But we've uh, had that for a while. Uh huh. Because the federal intrusion in education is part of the reason why we're in this mess is because with No Child Left Behind, that is um, because the there's no federal constitution or there's no constitutional justification for the federal Department of Education for this um, this bill to come in in 2021 as when it was signed by two by 
I'm sorry, 2001, not 2021, 2001. But, um, so by 2003, that's when they were piloting I station in the schools. Um, I also want to talk about the uh, when you when in looking at the star testing. So what a lot of parents don't understand is where it came from. And, um, and when you talked about the schools being rated instead of the students being or graded instead of the schools being graded. Uh, one thing that we've been asking for is for the commissioner to be graded or rated, and we give him an F based on his performance, because on all accounts, his spending is up, hires are up, but performance is down statewide. But that is based on a test, which, of course, I know you and I are in agreement with this, that the high stakes component is the problem with, the, with one problem with the test. Right. The other problem is it narrows the curriculum to what gets tested right. is what gets taught. Did you see that happening when you were a principal that you people yeah. started focusing more? Only my final year, okay? Because um, you got to remember where I was and um, we were a, basically a fairly affluent um, neighborhoods that we pulled from. Not okay, all. so your previous experience was with right. um, districts in poverty and different levels of income. Right. And by the end, you were in a more affluent district, so right. you weren't seeing it as much. Yeah. But when you okay. did your dissertation and all that, you had, had dug it. Out. Yeah, right. Yeah. Which is I good. It gave you the time to... to... Exactly. But so what, what do you it? think they need to do? I, what do parents need to know to... Is there anything that they can do to stop this takeover? I don't think there is, uh, short of uh, <laughs> busload after busload showing up at the Capitol uh, from HISD, from the parents. Um, the, the, here's, what, here's what parents need to remember. The accountability system is all about control, and it's all about making money. We, we have got to get rid of the accountability system. And so people, I've had, I've had senators and representatives ask me, how are we going to know if kids can read if we don't have the test? Right. They test. And my answer is always the same. The teacher will know and the parent will know. And between the two of them, they can get Johnny to read. Well, I and think so also we don't need a test to, to prove to the taxpayer that, that read. Johnny can read. We don't need that. In fact, it's detrimental. It's detrimental to his his well being because he's not getting a complete education. Right. He's getting a scripted education. Well, in looking at the reading wars, we know that the way that they teach now is not the way that you and I learned, which I would argue is the right way to learn to read. Deep phonics base and the 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 age appropriate um the the way that the lessons were age appropriate now it seems as though um not only are things not age appropriate but also they're doing cheater strategies is what i call them where they're doing sight words or whole language and and i know that you're not a reading instructor and neither am i but in studying the the remedies for these reading wars it's always technology that's what they they will pitch as technology is the solution and that's Marath's solution and i think with this new star star 2.0 which is supposed to be online star i think that just brings in a whole other a whole new layer of problems with this test because you you and i know that the teachers aren't able to see the instant results of what the kids how they do on that assessment mm -hmm. right and so then you've got a delay in that so it's not like you can really learn from that data truly mm -hmm. for that individual student is that true that's true now important to mention in this part of the conversation okay is mm -hmm. that if if we have a situation where um we believe that we're going to judge the school, the judge, the school's worth and the child's worth is going to be based upon how they do on the test. Then that's all that matters. So, uh, and then parents get the viewpoint, parents get the viewpoint that if your school is rated a C or a D or maybe even an F, then that's a reflection of nobody's learning mm -hmm. and that's a bad school. 
And if you get a B or an A, then everybody's learning, and that's a great school. Well, that's a that's an overgeneralization and and very false. There are kids what there are kids that are still learning in a D or an F school, mm-hmm. or let's say a, a let's just call it a C. They're they're still learning, and it's just that the challenges that the schools have are such that they can't overcome them all. It's and a they, disproportionate number of challenges. Yeah. Thus, you have mm-hmm. so. The whole accountability system, this is important for parents to understand, the whole, especially those in Title I schools, and for the affluent neighborhood schools, not to think that they're all that, okay? Their outcomes are coming from the fact that Mm -hmm. where they live and the fact that most of the parents, two two parents in the home, Mm -hmm. college educated, putting a great value on education. True. And and if if you get out of this, idea of this matrix with the, the the state and the government has created for everyone that we have good schools and bad schools then we can begin to work to understand why these things are happening and the fact that the title one schools located in poverty keep getting shamed in the public and yeah. keep getting um uh taken over or threatened by the commissioner only shows how inequitable the whole system is. I would agree. And they they don't take over affluent schools and white schools. So you have to ask yourself in the in a day and age where diversity, equity, and inclusion is constantly the the narrative that we're hearing, how does that fit in with that? Yeah. So it, it, it doesn't. And I there was another book that I always pair with yours. It, it's um, Diego Morel. Domingo Morel. And um, he wrote it, uh, I believe after, I'm not sure what year, but there, but his was talking about that aspect. So I was, I tell people, you know, if you pair the two, the uh, the two takeover books together, you can get a, a really complete picture. Um, not that yours doesn't, but it's just a different angle that he comes from. And his was more about Takeover bills in states that were more conservative, they've done more of, of this and through legislation, and it targets black and brown communities to take them over because that's low hanging fruit. So they can do it through the punitive accountability system. Right. Uh, and, and that to me is um, what's most egregious. And so you have to ask yourself too, is like, where is all this coming from? And if the goal is to privatize the schools, if the thought is that a corporate board and um, a, you know, private interests are going to be able to move the needle. Wouldn't charters indicate that 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 would be um, a fool's errand, since charters don't outperform our public schools, and they have appointed boards, and they are they use public dollars. Sure. You know. Yeah. What an important point to make at this point is these schools are being broken on purpose. Mm-hmm. Now, this is the, the tough part for parents to, to wrap their brain around. But we saw this in No Child Left Behind. It was so clear. It. it was I so clear. It. Yeah. The, the schools were driven to failure, and they had a solution in mind. And that was bringing people into Common Core. And we do have Common Core in Texas, even though we have laws that say we won't. You and I both know that we do. You talk to any teacher, they'll tell you we have Common Core. All of their all of their uh, literature tells them that they do. It's so, common for aligned by the majority of the standards. Correct. Yeah. Less so what, what they're doing now, since we know that they follow the, the dialectic, okay, problem, reaction, solution, right? Mm-hmm. Since we know they do that, they're doing it now again. And I saw this on full display when I went and watched the governor this past Tuesday, um, not this Tuesday, the one before when he spoke in Conroe and oh my gosh, Lynn, it mm-hmm. was on full display. And uh, the people in the audience were, were just really taken with the fact that he's willing to give them a choice to use their tax dollars to as an education savings account right. and choose how to use that money because that money is yours. But the state, the reality is the state doesn't believe that that money belongs to the parent. That's their money. 
And so they have they have promised they will not have strings attached. If you use that money to go to a private or if a homeschool parent uses that money to supplement materials, no strings attached. That's mm -hmm. what the governor is telling us. But you and I both know the government never gives away money for free. No, there's always strings. And even I've read some of the bills and they have explicit strings and they say with all confidence, no, there are no strings. And they say it boldly and they're very convincing. I almost believed it when Representative Toth said, no, there's no strings. You go and you read them. There are strings. They have appointed people that the governor is, is appoints through some of the bills. They have accreditation. You have to jump through hoops on that. You have to report uh, you have to do receipts on some of them, but I always say that once your private school accepts that, then that private school becomes public. Maybe not initially, but it is the camel's nose under the tent, and it will be under a similar accountability system because the goal is to have all children under this system through right. some sort of Title I portability, through a federal um, overlay where all children will, will be um, fed into this system. And the best way to access homeschool children and private school children is through the money carrot. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, um, one of the things that the private schools have to watch out for is that uh, they may not let kids coming in from outside of their areas, say inner city, whatever, come into their their private school that's located outside the city, you know, parents bring them. They may not allow that, but then they have to be careful of people already, parents that are already going to that private school using their education savings account that they establish to offset the tuition that they're already paying. And so they'll they drive up the price of the private schools? You think? Well, it's not so much that they drive up the price, but if a if a parent that is already having their child in that private school uses their tax dollars that they're using a backpack full of cash that all that lingo, then you've got you've got state money coming in to that private school through the parent who already has this kid going there, right? And then. But also the, uh, you know, the, um, the private schools, what I'm hearing is, is that it can drive up the price, but they discriminate. I mean, they can, they're a private school. They could take whatever child they, or whichever child they want. Uh, one of the arguments that I saw from TPBF, uh, Texas Public Policy Foundation, is that they were using the argument, well, you know, we do have school choice with charter schools and, but they don't take all children and you have to apply and, and all these things. Well, so I'm thinking that's the same argument with the private schools and we don't have enough schools to accommodate if the kids take those dollars and let them follow, if the dollars follow the child. There, in you think about food deserts that they have in South Dallas or Southern Dallas, for example, they also have private school deserts. So this is an assumption that the that this is a, a plan for parents to take that money and let it follow the child into a, a private school that's where there aren't even options in their neighborhood and and also in these rural communities. So it's not really a solution, but I know I think you and I agree on what the solution is, is let's fix the public schools. Let's return them to a classical model. Let's eliminate this accountability system, which is an invalid and unconstitutional. And I'll take that money that they spend on the testing giant, Pearson, which now has a newcomer um, embedded in the, the contract, Cambia, mm -hmm. a Dallas-based company. Um, but Cambium, it's an interesting history. I can put some of that in the the, the body of the in the comments here too. But um, it has a predictive analytics twist to it. These are there. I mean, just layers and layers of issues with this accountability system. But um, if we get rid of that and we get rid of the technology, that would free up the money to be able to pay the teachers to reduce the class sizes one to fourteen ratio. If we got rid of all the technology and um, go back to the old way of teaching, which would take some time to do, 
It wouldn't take that long, but we would have to train the teachers on the correct way to teach reading. Mm -hmm. But again, you could pay the teachers more. You could hire more teachers. You could reduce the class size mm -hmm. and train them in, di in, in districts and in the, in the, um, the colleges so that teachers come to the table prepared and ready to teach. And it would change the whole landscape of Texas education if there was that mm -hmm. will. Okay, one more thing about the governor. Mm -hmm. So one by one, before the governor spoke, parents came up to speak about why they came to that particular private school, which and it was a very good school, but they came to escape the public school yeah, because of A, because of B, because of C, and they didn't have that at the private school. Right. <clears throat> the governor got up to speak and he said, you won't have uh, if you if you allow us to pass the this whatever they were calling it um, parent empowerment parent empowerment to get uh, your education savings account then you won't have to have the social emotional learning you won't have to have the horrible discipline that is in place uh, all the things that he could fix as governor because he wanted more commitment. than that, Lynn, all the things that he allowed to come into the schools under his watch. All right, because he's been in there since 2015. Yeah, all of this but happened under his watch. It's broken on purpose, like you said. They let it. It's they let purpose. it crack and break on purpose, yeah. and then they make it worse. Oh, it makes me so sad. And the thing is, is like, I know there are a lot of people who say, oh, just burn the mother down, can't fix public schools. But when you understand that every legislative session, all the energy goes to vouchers and, and charters and school choice, and all that, all the fake choice options that we don't ever really, we're not allowed to address the solutions. You and I have very, very doable practical solutions you especially because you've been in the system you know what you could do to change it and it's growing uh increasingly difficult to i mean they, they're not keeping the institutional memory so those who actually have been trained the proper way i mean i'm 51 and i still have friends i have friends that are my age are still teaching so the institutional memory there is some and you could recruit recruit people back into the profession that uh, would come back if they knew it was different. And also the disciplinary issues. And oh, that was another thing with RTI that came in. I didn't realize the behavioral component of RTI response to intervention being more um, tied to behavioral uh, and discipline issues. I, I did not understand that piece until recently, but if the behavior was addressed and dealt with Instead, they've got all these these um, programs that have been harmful to schools. And we could ar argue Uvalde and, and um, some of these horrific, um, tragic events have happened because they've not enforced discipline. And so the kids know that they can get away with things and the bullying and all the issues aren't right. those, it's not being addressed. So, right. yeah, I mean, I, I know you and I wouldn't do what we do if we didn't have hope, but it is growing more and more uh, frustrating and, and seeming more and more hopeless because of the leadership we have. Right. Look, look at, look at, I know you probably are thinking we need to wrap it up, but look at, look at what has happened uh, at the State Board of Education. Mm -hmm. It just shows you that everything is controlled. Everything is under the thumb of the U.S. Department of Education through the waiver that I talk about because our good friend, Randy Houchins, yeah. he went to that state board how many times? I, I can't 15, remember. 17, yeah. yeah. And he's yeah. taken every no test from third through eighth grade. He's taken every test and yeah. testified on the issues with the math teaks, the standards. And he showed them where, the, where their test scores <clears throat> are going down and actually it's getting easier to take the test and yet the scores are still going down, which shows you that our math education is completely broken. When you, you know, Charlotte Iserbeet and talked about the, the deliberate dumbing down of a nation with her book. And uh, I know you've met her, but I read that years ago. So it does look as though it is a deliberate dumbing down. That's the only uh, conclusion I can come to. One thing I came to also is that, you know, if you can, the best way to, to shrink the achievement gap is to bring the top down, right? right. 
Yeah. So that, that I see that happening in the public school as well. Um, well, okay. Yeah, we will wrap up with some solutions. Any other, I know we covered the, you know, in the STAR test, take the money and put it towards the teachers and the kids in the classroom, shrink class size. What test. else would you say to do? We've got to get rid of the technology that has become the teacher. Not get rid of teaching technology, not get rid of learning about technology. Right. Keep that in. But we've got to get rid of the technology, the Chromebook, whatever device the district is contracted to use. We've got to get rid of that being the way the kids get their instruction. I would agree because Morath's, his solution, everything tends to be technology, technology vendors and putting a device in front of the students so that they can have those data dashboards and it's gamification of education as well. So it's like digital doggy bis biscuits that the kids will grab for to move them through the lessons, which is harmful, I believe. And the biggest, the biggest apple to get rid of, the rotten apple, is Mike Morath. Agreed. And yet he is, I think he has been reappointed by this He point. has been reappointed. Um, he has not been confirmed. And we believe uh, the governor, would he, so we think he's stalling on that. And I'm not sure why he's stalling on that. So the, mm -hmm. he hasn't filled out the official paperwork, but he's announced it that Morath has been reappointed through the office. And the, the other thing that, that we need to, to really try to encourage superintendents to band together mm -hmm. because they, I know, I know they have great retirement packages, okay? Uh, granted, they're making tremendous salaries. Why rock the boat? But mm -hmm. most of these superintendents mean well because they have come up as teachers, they have come up as principals, and now they're superintendents. Mm -hmm. And they're working in a corrupt system. Yeah. And they're allowing it to continue. They I agree. We do need some some superintendents. I, I only know of one who has the courage to come out. And, and so we're working with her. And um, so stay tuned on that. But yeah, we don't have enough superintendents. I know mine. They need to band together. Awesome. There's, there's courage in numbers. They need to band together. And they did that years ago with that TASA vision. But that was all about technology that really brought them to any path, any pace, any uh, it was all about learning on a device anywhere. And they and they banded together when Morath brought in the A through F grading of schools, which was totally, I mean, I, I just can't believe it. You know, it's so demeaning to the profession. It is. Um, they banded together on that issue. Against got, it? Against it, right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, here you've got a district that has got A and B schools going to it. And then you usually have an outlier uh, that is um, struggling every year to make it. Right. And, you know, a few, you got a, you got a elementary, a middle and a, and a high school that every year they've got to work hard at it to, to make it. And the rest of them are doing okay. Why as a superintendent, are you allowing that to continue when, right. when it's, it's, totally coming from the inequitable accountability system as to why those schools are are ashamed like that. And then they become drill and kill campuses where that's all right. they do. That's what they did. Our former superintendent, uh, Dr. Jeannie Stone, she poured all this money with a fake solution into our lower performing campuses through the what commit um, that commit model that's called the ACE campus model. And three years later, it wasn't sustainable and it didn't do any good because it was all about the test rather than really addressing the core issues with the, the curriculum and, and teaching them the way that they should be taught. Yeah. That all children can learn and they're going about it in a, a synthetic system, a very a counterfeit education yeah. system. And that... Yeah. Because that's what they're letting drive, you know, the tail wagging the dog. It's, it's the tail wagging doesn't the dog. Work. And they end up back in the same place because they don't address that foundational learning yeah. and build upon it like you and I had. So that's where those superintendents need to band together. Agreed. And there's courage in numbers. And if they could, if they could all be unified in their vision to sure. overturn the system that we're in. Yeah, they could do it tomorrow. It could it'd be done in three weeks. I mean, yeah. seriously, it's not. Yeah, I, I've, I always say the solutions are simple and the work is hard. 
All right. And right. no one's saying it, it's easy, you know, even from the older system that it was all, it was hard work. It's very hard work. And we need the parents to do their jobs, loving and, and uh, teaching their kids at home <laughs> so that when they come to school, they're, they're ready, yeah. and, you know, discipline at look home. At, look at what we saw in Marlin. I know. And that, that's actually an example of one that was taken over and I'd forgotten about that. It, and it's just so depressing to see how much get ground Marath has gained. Yeah. And the problems that they had, when you're a small district like that, you've got one elementary, one, one junior high, one high school. Yeah. And what we experienced in talking with the, the, the person who was brought in by Marath to oversee the takeover and the former superintendent was that the school they had the most trouble with was the elementary school because they were coming so deprived of anything that was uh, uplifting in terms of learning until they got to kindergarten. And, and then in junior high, it got better. And by the time they got to high school, they, they were making accountability. They mm -hmm. were, were on their way, but it was that elementary. And so it showed through hard work, they if you just it. leave them alone it's through hard problem. work, they can rise up. Yeah. But no, he had to come in there and take them over. So sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shout out to our, our friends who used to work in Marlin. That we yes. met. Yeah. Well, okay. So uh, any closing thoughts? Well, we just got to keep waiting for that tipping point, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Enough people know what we know that we can actually get, get some of those solutions. And, and we need some Thanks. people that with lots of influence and we've talked about some of them. We've, we won't mention names, but there are some people that have big influence that we've talked to. If they and, just understood what we're saying. Yeah, yeah, they've got to they've got to help. They've got to get us working in the right direction. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I appreciate all you do. I know that um you're a very uh a much needed voice in this fight. And um, you know, I I think it's unfortunate we don't have more people who are saying what you're saying and doing what you're doing. So I'm grateful for well, I appreciate that. you and what you've done uh, and learning from Alice Linehan mm -hmm. and then coming out and, and just getting after it and, and calling names and kicking butt I mean, names or else all, all, <laughs> all over the state of Texas. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, I do wish more principals would come out and, Mm -hmm. and uh, and speak against what they've had to endure you know once it, it's sad that that they they wait until after they're out to speak poorly of they've got to get on board and and yeah. that, i didn't do it okay but i didn't realize what was happening until i got out and was able to look back yeah well you figured it out and now you are using your voice to to make change we, we need to we, yeah, we need to have people, we, people need to share this with their superintendents and their, the leadership in their district. So they understand you can also, there's a little trick on um, YouTube where you can fast for, you can make it go faster. So we talk like this and we, you know, it's like a speed button on YouTube, but you know, for those who don't have the time to sit and listen to, uh, you know, the full segment, you can speed it up and get the gist of everything we're saying. And, and um, so I do that a lot when I'm listening to, to podcasts and things, I just speed it up and then I, you know, go about and do, I can do a while mm -hmm. or whatever. So, okay. Well, thanks so much, Pat. And, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to encourage people to, to, um, share this and, uh, be bold and, and name names and do as much as you can to get people to understand what's happening in our public schools. Thanks so Absolutely. much. Thanks, Lynn.